today's session basically is to talk about platform innovation in healthcare. Right? Uh, we'll we'll talk about why the healthcare industry has seen a massive boom in the last couple of years. Of course, you know why, but but we'll talk about the technology aspects of that and the business aspects of that. Uh, and we'll also talk about how interoperability and privacy play a role there and, and what the trade-off is there. Uh, along the way, we'll look at a number of points, 10 points to be exact, on, on the various impacts on the platform innovation and how you can basically take those opportunities and, and basically go to market using them. Uh, you had a great lineup of speakers today, and uh, I'll basically be following on to all of the sessions that you had uh, and, and uh, basically take it from there. So, so we, we should be able to complete the story uh, with the healthcare innovation uh, session. Just before this, you heard from uh, Chris on the finance, the BFSI side of the story as well. So starting with cloud native, going into platforms, looking at API integration and identity access management, and then ending it with solutions and how to really go to market using verticals and solutions. That's that's really the, the theme of uh, today and this talk. All right, let me move on. So in terms of an agenda, as I mentioned, we are going to look at the digital healthcare innovation side. Uh, I have roughly 25 minutes and really talk about the in interoperability and security and privacy, right? And basically how the two of them uh, intersect and how the two of them innovate and, and, and uh, integrate as, as well, right? So along the way, we'll come to this diagram at the end as well, uh, but along the way, we'll look at different parts of this circle and come to it uh, towards the end. Right? Uh, so one of the things I, I'd like to start with is this quote from uh, one of the US presidents, uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, basically talking about things that are urgent and, and things that are really important, right? But <clears throat> this is this is really true of the healthcare industry and the pandemic. During the healthcare industry, uh, du during the pandemic, really, the last one and a half years, uh, there are stats that say that there was around eight years of digital transformation in the healthcare industry within the last 18 months in total. <clears throat> Right. That's a massive deal. Uh, of course, different parts of the world have different healthcare systems, different healthcare technologies, uh, different initiatives. Like if you take uh, US, uh, it, it's, it's a very private healthcare driven industry, uh, insurance driven industry, health insurance driven industry, uh, a lot of business there. Uh, if you take other parts of the world, you have like single payer models, you have government uh, sponsored healthcare. Uh, you have a single healthcare or sil single organization model. So there are different kinds of models, but whatever the model uh, and whatever the type of care that is provided, uh, we've seen quite a number of initiatives in the healthcare space speci specifically uh, because there was a lot of challenges and, and compared to any other space, the healthcare space, so a lot of digital transformation. So in the space itself, if you look at the space itself, Things like interoperability has been around for a very long time. There have been standards organizations pushing for healthcare interoperability for a very long time. Right? But things really didn't come to the forefront because the focus of healthcare has been in different areas. Like for example, the focus has been in providing low cost medicine or, or population health or, or basically uh, uh, te telemedicine was not really a focus area until very recently. It, uh, and, and because now it became a necessity. Right? So this is a very interesting quote just to show that uh, innovation is, is important. Innovation is here in the healthcare space. Right? But let's look at the market and let's look at the opportunity before we move on to uh, various aspects. So this is a, a chart from McKinsey uh, that, that I pulled up and I'm sharing here, uh, which is interesting if you just focus on this chart, right? Like, all digital health value pools are expected to grow by 8% annually uh, through 2024. And, and if you look at the various categories, so there is quite a, quite a uh, focus on r and in, in healthcare, in wellness and prevention, uh, in care delivery, so on and so forth. So if you, if you take some examples, right, as I mentioned, telemedicine, uh, there has been a huge increase in telemedicine. Uh, there was a use case uh, again. I'll, I'll just pick some U.S. Uh, use examples as well. Uh, 
there was a use case uh, in US where New York Langone University saw a 4,000% increase in their telemedicine visits. Uh, WSO2 has a customer as well uh, who, who basically is very big in the healthcare insurance, the healthcare provider space, the integrated delivery network, which is combination of insurance and, and uh, hospitals. And, and they saw a triple or a quadruple increase in the infrastructure. They, they required quadruple increase in the infrastructure just because they had a massive increase in telemedicine visits. Right? And, and we, WSO2 was the one powering the telemedicine APIs in, in that uh, scenario. So it's clear that in the healthcare space, digital transformation is here to stay. And then there is a lot of initiatives going forward as well. It's not just something that is, is happening during the pandemic. There's a lot of initiatives and a lot of impact <clears throat> in the years to come because people have now gotten used to virtual care visits, uh, uh, telemedicine visits, uh, care from home, uh, using devices and connecting devices to backend systems so that doctors can do remote monitoring of patients. All of these are basically here to stay. And the pandem pandemic was a good indication that this worked, right? So uh, th there's a lot of uh, good things that happened there. And at the same time, the healthcare innovation was at an all time high as well. Again, the last two years, this was building up to this. But if you if you look at the various uh, articles and the various news aspects, the, you, you would see that innovation is at a uh, all time high. And you just look at a few points, right? So investment in digital healthcare is, is at record high levels. Uh, in Q3 and Q4 of 2020, private venture capital investment was at its highest ever in the digital healthcare space. So you have healthcare, which is anything from, from providing care to patients, anything. And then you have digital healthcare, which is the digital side of it, right? And that's, that's where most of the growth is. Uh, there were a number of joint ventures, partnerships, mergers and acquisitions, alliances uh, with, between very large organizations. Uh, I think there was Microsoft's acquisition of Navitech, which was a healthcare data company, a healthcare artificial intelligence company. That was Microsoft's second biggest ever acquisition after, after really uh, GitHub. Uh, so, so that that shows how big the healthcare space is and how much imp, uh, how much uh, impact there is in that space. There was a, a massive increase in the newer digital health startups, newer industries. Right, so so massive increase in that space. Uh, the healthcare sector is moving into cutting edge technology as well. So there is a lot of IoT work going out there. Uh, there is a lot of sensor work happening in the space. And then, very interestingly, big tech moving into healthcare. Because I think uh, as one of the themes you would have heard today in the various sessions, uh, every company is really a software company. Uh, my take on that is every company is a software platform company as well, right? So you're working with multiple stakeholders, you're working with technology and healthcare is no exception. Right? You can see a lot of companies moving into the technology side, moving into the software side, building massive software arms uh, and, and starting to build platforms and technology. But at the same time, you see the technology companies, the pure technology companies moving into the healthcare space as well and trying to disrupt that space. Right? So, so that's that's massive. Uh, Google, uh, Apple both have a large healthcare set of initiatives. They recently disbanded some of them so that they can distribute them a bit more. Um, Amazon started moving into the pharma space. So if you go into uh, the Amazon website today, you can also sign up for pharmacy subscriptions. So Amazon is starting to get, go big on the pharma space. Uh, Microsoft is, is going really big into healthcare. Uh, they have the fire initiatives, the fire data initiatives. Um, so, so most of the big tech is looking into healthcare as well and of ways to disrupt healthcare and share data during, in, in healthcare and bring the whole technology aspect into healthcare. And so, so it's clear that innovation is key, uh, either for now and for the coming years. And interoperability is really a key part of, of innovation. Again, uh, this chart is from uh, Class and Chime, which are two uh, health analyst organizations. 
And, and if you look at this, you can see between just 2017 and 2020, the increase in, in various aspects of healthcare, like specifically electronic access, uh, the record location. So record location is usually in healthcare, electronic health records, electronic medical records. Uh, so so it's, it's an interesting chart, but it's a known aspect as well, right? And interoperability is a key to innovation. So that's, that's the major theme of, of uh, today's talk. All right. So one of the interesting aspects in healthcare, uh, and, and this might be very similar in BFSI and finance as well, right? So if you take BFSI, you have a lot of information in the co-banking systems. If you go to a bank, one of their core systems is a co-banking system. If you take healthcare, almost universally, the single system, the single uh, record of truth is an electronic medical record system or interchangeably, you call it an electronic health record system. There are small variations of what kind of data is stored, but there are systems, dedicated systems out there, which might be on-premises systems, which might be cloud services, which store patient data. Right? And, and most of the logic is stored here. Uh, one of the largest in the world is Epic. Uh, Epic controls, I think, more than 65% or 70% global stake. Uh, Cerner is a close second. And, and then you have organizations like Athena Tech, uh, uh, so on and so forth, uh, in, in this space. And then there are a large number of EMRs in the space. Right? Uh, so, so again, coming back to the main point is that a lot of information has historically been stored in electronic medical records. And that's going to be the way for a long time. There are, of course, disruptors in this space as well. People who are trying to build uh, the, the EMR alternative where you store information in blockchains, where you distribute patient information. But for most hospitals and, and insurance companies and any anyone dealing with healthcare, EMRs is a main part and, and a critical part of the healthcare digital supply chain. Uh, this is an interesting article uh, from uh, from early this year or, or late last year, uh, which which is basically about Epic. Uh, there was a hospital in US who had three different EMR systems, which is quite common in, in hospitals, which means you have like patient information in different systems. Maybe you have different types of patient information in the different systems, or you have... Uh, patient information in one and, and, and associated information in other systems. Uh, this hospital in US tried to get the information out of the EMR and, and make use of that information right, for various reasons. There was a US regulation coming up as well, and that meant you had to pull the information out and make it available to patients. Right? So th uh, they couldn't do that. They found it tough to do that. So they instead went with an approach of switching to Epic. Uh, and, and this was a $650 million uh, migration project uh, over three years. So, but this is exactly the point about healthcare. You don't really need to do this. You need a layer in front or you need the technology which can really connect to these EMRs, pull the data out of it and make meaningful use out of this backend system. That's your basic uh, concept, right? So you get the information out and then you start making use of the information. Then you figure out how do you expose this to applications like Apple Health. Then you figure out how do you do telemedicine visits and how do you interact with the backend system? All of the normal <clears throat> use cases. And, and this is similar, as I mentioned, in, in co-banking and any other system like warehouse systems, right? So. Uh, so, so basically, that's uh, that's the that's the base concept, right? So, the important thing in healthcare is how do you get the information out of my EMR? There are cases where the EMRs don't have APIs; they only have database access. There are cases where people store patient information in pure databases, not an EMR uh, as well. There are scenarios where the EMR might have proprietary API access. Uh, there are situations where it's not an HTTP API. There are many challenges, right? But that's why it's important. Uh, that after the, uh, that's why it's important that you have access to the data, that you can pull the data, and you can build the abstraction layer uh, out of the data. Right? So that's that's one one major part uh, of of this. The second major part is that 
interoperability is not just in one layer. It's not just pulling data out of the EMR or the EHR uh, and, and then exposing those as APIs. It's also about connecting your supply chain. Right? Uh, today, you see there's many supply chain issues globally, right? and, and uh, there's many reasons for that. And you have the whole global semiconductor chip shortage, uh, and that leads to uh, electronic devices shortages, and that leads to car shortages. So supply chain is a critical uh, factor today. In healthcare, this is even more critical. And I'm talking about the digital supply chain as well, right? So if you look at this diagram, most of you would relate to this. You have a, a provider, which is a hospital. You call that a hospital. You pro call it a care provider, whatever the name is. Uh, you have someone who pays for the hospitals. That's the payer or the insurance companies. In some cases, this can be government. Um, you, you have vendors who supply to the hospitals and the insurance companies. Uh, these can be the, the electronic health record systems, again, medical record systems, the, the scanning device systems, the healthcare manufacturers, uh, any of that. Right? And then you have the suppliers who supply various goods uh, as well, the providers and even the payers. Right? So it's a multi-stakeholder ecosystem. And at the end, the one to benefit out of this is really the patient. Right? This is all about making the experience seamless for the patient so that the patient is uh, happy. But so the important aspect here is you should be able to connect everything if you want to provide a seamless experience, which means the hospital needs to be able to connect to the 20 different insurance companies that the patients bring in. The hospitals need to be able to connect to the backend EMR systems, and it can be one or it can be hundreds. Right? We worked with a healthcare organization that had nearly every single EMR under the sun. Uh, so, and then I think that was around 50, but there are like, hundreds and hundreds of EMR systems out there. Uh, you need to be able to expose information to third party applications. You need to be able to expose information to the insurance company so that they can pull medical records. So it's important to be able to connect <clears throat> all the parts of your healthcare supply chain. <clears throat> so that's the second one. Now, the third one is standards. Right? So if you've seen the, the word fire, uh, which is which stands for fast healthcare interoperability resources. Fire is a, a version of HL7, and HL7 is a healthcare standard, right? So, uh, Fire is basically a healthcare standard. This is a global standard uh, created by the HL7 organization. Uh, so, if you just go to hl7.org, you see all of their standards. Uh, so, they have global standards like a standard for how to define patients, how to define uh, medicine or drugs how to define the experience, like where you go to a hospital, you have a, a ex encounter at the hospital, like how do you explain that? So there's a set of APIs <clears throat> and there's a set of predefined fields. And it's very comprehensive because this is healthcare, right? So very, very comprehensive. Uh, what also happens there is each region or each country has the option of taking those APIs or, or those resources and customizing them or localizing them <clears throat> for their region, excuse me. Uh, so if you take US, you have a, a US Da Vinci specification, you have a US core specification. If you have Netherlands, they, they, Netherlands has its own specification. If you have Middle East, Middle East has its own variation of the specifications. Germany has uh, its own variations. So, so there, there are localized versions of these specifications as well. But the good thing is, exactly that right it's localizations of global specifications so if if a specific country has a, a certain way of uh, describing medicine right, then that will go into local specification and and that means it's standards based communication so of course as with any standards this means interoperability becomes that much more easier right you can basically connect to back end systems you can expect that a backend system would be able to share uh, some kind of standard and or you can use uh, the standard as your canonical model within your platform right so example let's say you're connecting to a backend electronic medical record system uh, you can expect that that will share fire or hl7 with you if it doesn't you can build an accelerator which can do a transformation from whatever format to fire and then your central system totally deals with fire Right. So, so that's one of the advantages, the big advantages of having standards-based 
uh, healthcare. The other part of it is the whole world is moving towards uh, standards-based healthcare. Uh, and there's a lot of initiatives already. Like if you take UK, the NHS, nearly all communications within the NHS happens using uh, the FHIR standard. Uh, if you take Australia, uh, there's a lot of initiatives in Australia. Everything's basically based on HL7 version 2 or, or FHIR. Uh, and then in the US, the government has stepped in to regulate uh, the usage of FHIR as well to make sure that FHIR is the standard that is used across the board for healthcare communication. Right? So there, there's a lot of advantages of standards. And this is a big factor in interoperability. Right? So then the fourth one is basically regulations. Regulations also drive interoperability, especially uh, this is from the US. Uh, in the US, there is a, a government regulation saying every healthcare insurance company needs to expose patient information as FHIR APIs to third party applications. Simple as that, right? There are variations of that. Uh, there are There's another set of regulations for the hospital saying, if some application developer wants to access your API, uh, wants to access patient information, you need to expose that. Right? So regulations are a, a blessing in disguise in most cases because it, it promotes interoperability. <clears throat> so that brings us to my first reference architecture. I'll go to a second one before I finish, uh, which is really to show that everything that we discussed so far, right? You have, if you look at the bottom part of your screen, you have Backend devices, like you have the EMR systems like Cerner's, Epix, you have data sitting in databases, you have data sitting as services, cloud apps, uh, variable devices, etc. So you need a way of connecting to these backend systems. Uh, so for that, you, you can have like accelerators which can connect and transform. You can have data mapping systems where you say, here's my patient data in Cerner, here's my patient data in Fire in the API, right? So you have accelerators and connectors to connect to backend systems. And then the other part of this is the, the top part of the diagram where you have consumers of the system. Uh, and you have a API gateway, you have your developer portals, you have, your, you have a fire server, which is a special thing in healthcare, uh, where it's a server to expose fire APIs. There are certain capabilities that the server should have. Right? So that's, that's a big picture. <clears throat> On this diagram, on the left-hand side of the diagram, you have something called an API definitions hub. That's really a, pre -set, a set of pre-templated APIs to be able to expose these APIs. Okay, so moving on. Now we looked at interoperability. The other big part is security. Now you're starting, you're starting to expose APIs as a healthcare organization, which is really good. Uh, you are starting to bring in external stakeholders. But already the, the healthcare industry is plagued by cyber attacks and, and uh, cracks and hacks and all kinds of things, right? Uh, so, and, and these are just a few screenshots of some of the attacks. This happens on a daily basis. This has brought down hospitals as well. A lot of information has been shared. So now if you open up APIs, can this mean more attacks? Uh, there is a report, I think, coming out next week uh, by one of the cybersecurity hackers on whether the FHIR APIs are, are uh, secure as well. And the HL7 organization is working around that as well. But one of the advantages is if you do follow the, like the OWASP principles, uh, if you do use API gateways, and, and if you use all of the best practices, a lot of these issues are already addressed in other industries as well. Right? Yeah. Granted, healthcare is much, much more critical than any other industry out there. But if you do use most of these, uh, we, we are a long way in achieving a very secure set of APIs and very secure set of data transfer already. And I'm not going to go into this because you, you know most of this. But one of the really interesting things in healthcare is consent management. Because what you are doing today is you are really exposing data, <clears throat> you're exposing APIs to like different systems but the objective of all of that is to make the patient's life better, right? To make it seamless for a patient to move from one insurance company to another, to move from one hospital to another, or to provide better care for that uh, patient if he's moving, if he or she is moving from, let's say, one division to, uh, and going for a newer surgery, right? You have to make sure that the history goes with the patient, the context goes with the patient, 
uh, and all the the background information like allergies and everything goes with the patient right you don't want to start start from scratch right so that's really the objective here and along the way the healthcare industry is also trying to achieve newer much more innovative use cases telemedicine is a major example of this uh, app based uh, healthcare like personal healthcare apps which can track your uh, healthcare across multiple hospitals multiple insurances is another usage of this right what that all means is that it's your data it's the patient's data that's been exposed which means the patient needs to provide consent to accessing that data right and yes we have consent management in health uh, in in banking and finance as well but in healthcare it's a deeper level right so as a patient i need to say i am exposing my first name to this app i'm i'm giving access to my date of birth to this app for this period of time so it's a much more granular level of consent uh, management. Right? So this is just a flow diagram showing how, how that works, where you have patients, you have third-party applications, and the third-party applications are the ones who request consent, and the patient is the one who provides consent. There are special cases where you have delegated consent management, where the patient should be able to say, hey, I'm giving consent on behalf of my son, for example. Uh, and and i'm giving consent to access his data right so just to uh, give a concrete example of that here are two screenshots from uh from from the w sort of solution itself i put the link down there one on the left shows a granular consent management screen which says okay uh, i'm giving access to my patient data which is my patient name i'm giving access to a custom set of data which is maybe my data birth and my address and i'm giving access for a specific period of time on the right hand side is a portal where I'm going to go and see all the applications that have access to my data and then be able to revoke access to my applications. Right? Consent management is a critical part of healthcare, especially when you start exposing APIs internally and externally. Uh, and consent management is not an area that many organizations focused on. Right? It's usually you go into an organization, you fill a piece of form, there's a piece of consent there that you don't read, you tick the box and come off. And that's a global consent. That's no longer good. Right? It's go it's moving to a scenario where consent management is much more digital, and patients have a lot of control over their data. So, those were really the eight, nine, ten points. I, I lost track of the number of points that I mentioned, but I'll bring it all together in this final slide and this last diagram. Right? So, as a healthcare blueprint, what we are looking at is. You have existing components that, that we spoke about during the day today. You have the API gateways, you have the API marketplaces, uh, and that's critical if you want to follow OWASP principles as well and, and have secure APIs. You have concepts like fire servers, et cetera, that are spe specialized, uh, specialized components for healthcare. Right? And these are consumed by uh, insurance companies, by hospitals, by specialized healthcare applications by the Apple Health and the Google Health and all of these, right? Uh, similarly, another specialized component for healthcare is like pre-built templates, pre-built APIs, pre-built accelerators. Uh, there are the HL7 and uh, FHIR standards out there, right? So, so the, most of these re are required within the system. So if you're building a system, you need to have these. If not, you're going to build from scratch, right? So, so I think We've seen situations where people starting with these templates do have at least 60% of time savings in their initiatives. And then you've got the accelerator layer, which is really to connect to backend systems and be able to convert those backend systems to canonical data models, right? Which means you need connectors to like Cerner's, Epics, et cetera. Uh, we have built it in such a way that we have a tool that auto generates connectors. If, if you have a system that exposes fire, if you have a system that exposes HL7 v2, or if you have systems that expose uh, open API specifications itself, right? And, and then we also have accelerators of the all the fire APIs out there. So if you are going to expose a patient API, you can start with the pre-built API and then connect to the backend system. Right? So accelerators are key because, as I mentioned, the single source of truth is really uh, the backend systems in healthcare. And these can be electronic medical record systems, Financial information is usually in revenue cycle management systems or RCMs. So, so you have a lot of information there as well. That makes up your interoperability side.
But on the other side, what's shown in red here is the security and privacy side, right? So you need uh, fine-grained access control. You need the ability to rate limit and throttle. You need to be able to do spike address. Everything supported in the API gateway side of things. And then consent management is a special case because we, we need to build a finer grained consent management, not the coarse grained consent management, because you need to be able to go into a resource of an API and then control that resource. Whereas standard consent management is usually at an API level. So that's, that's the second part of it on the security and privacy. And digital healthcare innovation is really a, a, a combination of security uh, and privacy and the intersection of security and privacy. So that's really the, the objective of the talk today, uh, to talk about what digital healthcare innovation is, why the platform approach is important there, and how interoperability and privacy intersects uh, to form a trade-off there. Uh, at WSO2, what we've done is we've taken our experience of the past 15 years working with healthcare industry, uh, and then we productize that into a cloud-based healthcare solution. Uh, most of you might have seen it. If not, I've shared some links uh, to, to our sandbox. There's a sandbox out there that you, you can try out as well. And there's some articles uh, too. Uh, 